So today, um, I'm going to tell you a story about a volcano, and it's a story that is is one that's been generated by a collaboration, which most research these days is a collaboration. And in this case, it's a collaboration between um, myself, Danielle Vergani, and Rebecca Carey. We're all UTAS affiliated. And um, Andrea DeMuro, he's a volcanologist, or he was a volcanologist, um, at the observatory on Reunion during, during the 2007 eruption. Daniele and Andrea are both Italian. Daniele came to University of Tasmania to do his PhD. So much of the data that I will present was collected during the course of his, um, his PhD. And to go forward, I'm guessing I push the big arrow? Yes. So chances are you might only have a sketchy idea of where Reunion Island actually is. So I thought I'd begin with a little bit of geography and a little bit of um, history. Uh, so Reunion is, is, oops, wrong one, here in the Indian Ocean. And it's remarkably easy to get to from Australia. It's just a matter of getting to Perth and then there's a direct flight uh, a few days every week. But initially, uh, it was a very remote location. And I, I chose to show you this map, which indicates where Reunion Island is, but it also shows that it became very important during the 15th and 16th and 17th century because its location falls on the trade routes between Europe um, and India and the Spice Islands. This map is showing the trade routes used by the British uh, merchant companies, but the Dutch and the Portuguese also uh, followed the same routes. And you can see where Reunion actually is. It's, um, it's a good spot to get fresh water, fresh supplies. Um, in the early days, it actually was uninhabited and known about by Arab explorers and sailors, but not permanently inhabited. The gradual rise of trade with, um, with the Southeast Asia and India meant that it was visited periodically by Portuguese, Dutch and English explorers and merchants. Um, and eventually it was claimed by the French, Ile de Bourbon was its first name. This word Bourbon is um, the name of a French kind of dynasty that was very powerful up until the Napoleonic era. And as I mentioned, very important as a, a stopover on the trade routes. Um, that, that importance increased. Why isn't it going forward? Maybe I'll try this way. That'll work. Because it was gradually developed as um, a source of various resources for France. And in particular, to begin with, coffee. And with that came slavery. And then finally, coffee was replaced by sugarcane. So th this development led to a very big increase in population. So in 1763, about 22,000 people, 80% of whom were slaves. Um, and it officially became Reunion Island in 17. 93. It was briefly British territory during the Napoleonic Wars, but then returned to France. And slowly coffee was replaced by sugar cane. And although uh, slavery was abolished in 1848, and at that time there were 62,000 slaves on, on the island, uh, the slaves were replaced by indentured 
labourers. So that was only kind of slightly better than being a slave. They had a little bit more independence. And the whole trade route connection started to fade when the Suez Canal was opened because it was a whole lot easier to go through the Suez Canal than to go through, go around the south of Africa. Slowly, uh, during the late 19th and early 20th century, infrastructure was further developed and it became a, an overseas department of France in 1946. It's only a small island. You could fit four of them between here and Hobart. So uh, not very big at all, but it's got a million people living on it. And most of them just in a, a small number of towns, because as you'll see in a minute, most of the island is very rugged and steep and not easy to live on. So uh, I thought you might be interested to see some of the early ways the volcano that we're going to talk about was illustrated. This map um, on the left, 1720, shows the volcano. It's in that red circle. They recognised that it was a mountain and a mountain that erupted. And then uh, about 50 years later, this drawing on the right giving full, I guess, full uh, notice of Piton de la Fournay's volcano as the main active centre um, on, the on, the, on the island. So uh, the, local, the local explorers and um, local naturalists certainly were very interested in this active volcano. This is the coat of arms and uh, it features up in the top left the three main mountains and one of them you can see erupting. That's the one we're going to talk about. The highest one is 3,000 metres high, and that's why you've got the three M's there to represent 3,000. The other symbols, uh, one relates to uh, being a, uh, connected to France. Um, the three lilies are featured on many French kind of coats of arms and flags, and the bees relate to the Bourbon dynasty. And this is one of the ships, one of the first uh, French ships to, that was involved in, in laying claim to the island for France in the early history. So um, that's it for kind of background where it is, a little bit of history. The rest is going to be geology and then we'll get on to looking at uh, the particular eruption that I want to tell you about. So the, the island's almost entirely made of volcanic rocks and it has a very interesting location. You'll be aware that lots of volcanoes are related to margins between the lithospheric plates that form the outer shell of the earth and most of the volcanoes around the Pacific are located on boundaries between lithospheric plates. But we also get volcanoes unrelated to boundaries. And the, the way they're understood is that they're above a hot spot. So deeper in the earth, there's a heat anomaly that causes melting. And above that, we get a volcano. Now, the tricky thing is, is that the plates are not stationary. They're actually moving slowly. And in this case, uh, Réunion is on a plate that's slowly moving northward. So uh, right up here in, on India, there is a big area of volcanoes, much, much older, but we can track that line of volcanism um, coming south and getting younger. There's a bit of an offset, and then it continues to come south until we get to Réunion. So this is the youngest volcano to be generated by a hot spot in this location while this plate is slowly moving northward. And that's what the cartoon down the bottom is trying to show you. These kinds of chains of volcanoes that are related to slowly moving plates above a hot spot 
are quite common. There's a few of them in the Pacific and several of them in the Atlantic Ocean as well. So essentially, uh, this island is made by volcanic rocks that are occurring where they work, where they are, because they're above one of these hotspot locations. Um, and there's two main volcanic centres. One, uh, which is in the northwest, is called Piton de Neige, which means snow peak. And the one in the southeast, which is the active volcano, Piton de la Fournaise, which means furnace peak. This view is looking uh, towards the south, uh, the southeast. So this is the snow peak and the furnace peak behind. The snow peak, Pit on Denage, it's actually a volcano that's now completely dead. It's completely extinct, not expected to erupt again. And you can see most of the towns and the development is on the flanks of that volcano and the centre is very deeply excavated just by erosion processes being worn away. Um, and the other one, Furnace Peak or Piton de la Fournaise, is really active. It erupts pretty much every year. Both of these volcanoes are made of a kind of magma that we call basalt and I just need to um, uh, digress for a minute to explain a little bit about this word basalt. It, it actually relates to the composition of the lava or the magma and this one flows very easily so when it produces lavas, lavas go a long way from the vent. Sometimes this kind of composition can also explode but the explosions are very weak and essentially just jets of gas-rich basalt lava um, firing up above the vent. Relatively safe kind of explosive eruption to, to get close to. Over on the right, I, I can't sort of show you a spectrum of magma compositions easily, but I can show you a spectrum of, of oils that are varying in how easily they flow. So on the left, that oil is flowing really easily and as we take a step to the right, each increment is, illustrates that the flow is restricted or it's quite limited until right over here the flow is barely happening at all. So we get some magmas behaving like this end of the spectrum and some behaving like this end. And this is the one that matches basalt. But if I say that word, I'm just meaning this composition of magma that flows very easily. The other bit of volcanology that I need to share with you is what we call the eruption style, which is essentially just how the magma comes out of the vent. We have these two categories effusive and explosive and illustrations of um, each of those. So effusive eruptions produce lavas and that's what's going on here. We've got a, a vent and it's erupting and here we have a stream of molten, this is also basaltic lava. But on the right, that magma is exploding and so we end up with um, broken up magma forming a deposit at the Earth's surface and we call these pyroclastic deposits, sort of means high, high, a fire and broken up. Now in volcanology we use this subdivision all the time and it helps us distinguish between simple eruptions that have really just one eruption style and going on at one vent. So that's the very simple case and it contrasts with complex eruptions, which is what I want to talk about today, which can involve multiple eruption styles and multiple vents active simultaneously. And the reason I chose 
uh, the PDF 2007 eruption to talk about was that it's, it was a very complex event, very good illustration of how complicated volcanic eruptions can be. Um, so what kind of data are available when you want to study an eruption? For this one, there's a lot of different data sets. One was essentially just photographs taken by webcams that are in safe locations around the vent. And these cameras are programmed, so they take uh, a still shot every 10 seconds or every minute, and also occasionally videos. And so you get to see what was going on from three different angles. There's also seismic data available and earthquakes and volcanoes really go together because when magma moves underground it causes shaking of the ground. A particular style of earthquake is associated with the movement of magma underground. Um, and also when there are big landslides on volcanoes that can be large enough to produce an earthquake that we can recognise in seismic records. The other thing that magma does when it rises to shallow levels, it changes the level of the ground surface above. Sometimes there is an inflation or an increase in altitude and sometimes a defl deflation or a decrease in altitude. And these days, those changes are used, uh, measured with very precise GPS that's recorded and uh, transmitted in real time to the observatory. Observatory volcanologists uh, visited the volcano whenever they could, mainly by helicopter, and samples were taken uh, regularly through the eruption. This cartoon just shows you the range of different ways volcanic activity can be recorded, both during an eruptions, both during eruptions and between eruptions. So we used all of these data in uh, figuring out what went on. I've already mentioned it was complicated. It was complicated because there were four main locations between the summit and the coast, uh, separated by about 12 kilometres, over which activity occurred. Three main eruption styles and it lasted about three weeks. Also, Although it, all, it was all basalt coming out, the kind of basalt that was coming out changed during the eruption. And that's an aspect I'm not going to talk about. It's another layer of complication that um, is kind of beyond what I'll have time to deal with today. But the view in the background shows you uh, from a distance, this is from, taken from St. Denis on the northern coast, it shows you at least the wide separation between what was going on. That's not actually the summit. It's near the summit. The summit is kind of up over here and spreading all the way to the coast and then more activity at the coast uh, during that three-week event. This is complicated, so don't panic. I'll try to explain it to you. Firstly, what we have up the top is just a calendar. Okay, it's just showing you um, the, end of, the end of April over here and then the beginning, sorry, end of March and the beginning of April for the duration of the volcanic activity. And the one, two, three, four relate to different sites on the volcano. So the summit is here and this is the coast. And there were, the, there were four main locations where volcanic activity happened. And the order I've given here is the order in which the activity occurred. So number one was limited just to the 30th of March. Number two beca began on the 2nd of April, went through to the 14th. So this is out here on the flank. Number three was right at the summit, beginning on the 5th and going through to the 17th. Number four on the coast operated just for one day on the 6th of April. So this is kind of colour-coded and as we go through the rest of the talk, 
these colours are used to relate to the different stages of volcanic activity in this very complicated event. So the first uh, was almost at the summit. The summit is at 2,600 metres above sea level and this event uh, involved a little eruption of lava at this location at 1,900 metres above sea level. But it wasn't just lava coming out at the surface. So if I just go back, what you'll see here is that a red shade will appear. That's significant. That red shade is that part of the volcano that started to inflate, started to rise up on the 30th of March. So that's what I've written here. Inflation of the northern and eastern side of the summit and a very small lava erupted at number one um, on the 30th of March. This turns out to be really important. Although it was a trivial uh, volume of basalt produced, the overall event figures prominently in later uh, stages of the eruption. So in the next slide, I will begin to talk about events two, three and four. And this first slide is just uh, three images about those three events. So number two, Pitt and Tremblay at 600 metres above sea level, fountains. Number three, right at the summit, what happened was there was a huge collapse event affecting the entire summit region. And then number four, the coastal um, explosions at the coast. In the next series of slides, I'll firstly talk about Pitt and Tremblay, then summit collapse, and then lastly, the explosions at the coast. And you can see, even if you forget everything else I'm about to say, you can see these are all very, very different uh, styles of volcanic activity going on through that course of the single eruption. So vents, the fountains are places where gas-rich basalt gets uh, kind of jetted out of a vet, vent and the jetting happens because of the gas decompressing. It's under high pressure when it's underground and as it reaches atmospheric pressure it expands and that produces this kind of feature, a jet. Uh, but <laughs> even that wasn't simple. There were actually three simultaneously, vent simultaneously active vents and they're shown down here on this map. I've got arrows pointing to each of the three active vents and one of the jets was vertical, the other was inclined between about 30 and 40 degrees and the other one uh, less than 20 degrees inclination and they were, they were each located at the ends of those arrows you can see um, in the bottom left view. And if you go there, uh, if you go to this location and look to the southeast, this is what you see. There's one of the vents, then um, another, and the other is concealed because it's just off that slope. And in the distance, uh, we can see the rest of the products of the eruption and the coast, um, roughly 10 kilometres, 8 to 10 kilometres away. So this sort of activity, it's a kind of explosive activity, and so it generates pyroclastic deposits. And the uh, photo here over on the left, that's a little digging spade that we use to sample pyroclastic deposits. And you can see it's no more than about a, a metre or so thick and made up of fragments, droplets from the fountains of different size. And it's possible to look at them very carefully and analyse them and measure the bubbles and so on and you can make up all kinds of stories about the fountain activity. So this sort of deposit here shown in the left photograph collects close to the source <laughs> but further away what this fountain activity actually generates 
is a lava flow because the droplets are really hot and incandescent. And when they hit the ground, they coalesce and make a stream of lava, uh, what we call a fountain-fed lava. This particular example is, or particular case, you see there's a little video off on the right. This is uh, the kind of lava that was generated by that fountaining. It's what we call an a'a lava. It's a Hawaiian word. And it's lava that moves as a kind of pile of rubble, uh, pushing its way across the surface. And that process uh, went on for about six days, making lavas that went from the Pitten Tremblay vent all the way to the coast. These different colours give you the uh, ages, if you like, or the order uh, of the lava flow emplacement going from the source vent down to the coast. So the activity at Petun Tremblay was fountaining. It produced pyroclastic deposits near the source, but also produced lava flows that went all the way to the coast. And as you saw, there were three active vents um, at this location. So that was a quick review of Pitt and Tremblay. Now going to focus on what happened next. And what happened next after the fountain started on the flank was all at the summit. And it was an event that we call Caldera Collapse. So that top view is a view of the summit of Piton de la Fournaise before the 5th of April and then after the 5th of April. And you can see it's gone from a flat, flawed kind of dish shape to a really deep chasm. So I need to explain this word caldera. It's another technical term that we use in volcanology. It's used when volcanoes have a special shape and size. So what's special about the shape is that the centre of the volcano is a depression quite a large diameter, usually at least two or three kilometres across. Some of them are up to 20 kilometres across. And it's a depression that has a very strong link with volcanic activity. Um, and in particular, the volcano collapses, the surface collapse occurs because magma is withdrawn, magma is taken away. Now, there's two main ways that magma is removed, and they're shown by these cartoons on the right. So one way, we have magma underground, and then it comes out the top of the volcano and erupts, and that removes the magma, so the surface collapses, producing a depression. That's what I'm trying to show by this cartoon. But we can also get to that end point if the magma, instead of coming out at the surface, moves sideways, which is quite a different way to remove the magma. But the, the end result is the same. We get collapse um, at the surface and the formation of a caldera. So the caldera is not a volcanic vent. It's way, way bigger than a volcanic vent. Most vents are only a few tens of metres across. It may have vents within it once it's formed, um, but it's essentially a depression in the Earth's surface created because magma that was underground has been removed. And this happened at Piton de la Fournaise. So this collapse that, we, that was recorded uh, on the 5th of April was the was the um, result of removal of magma. This caldera has a, a separate name that doesn't really matter, but it, it's got a long history of going through being filled up and then collapsing. But the event in 2007 was the biggest that's happened since reliable re records have been kept. It's now about 
just over a kilometre across um, and about 330 metres deep. So I want to just spend a few minutes talking about this event and trying to explain that the style of collapse was what we call piecemeal, meaning it wasn't just a single down-dropping event but took place over a number of days by incremental uh, collapse events. And also, what was really unexpected, a whole lot of activity then started going on inside the caldera. Uh, lava emissions, explosions and landslides. These maps all show the caldera as it is today, um, but superimposed on that with the dashed lines are the portions of the former caldera floor that collapsed successively. The biggest was on the 5th of April. Most of the northeast and east and southern parts of the caldera floor all subsided on that day. There were further significant collapses on the 6th and then on the 7th of April and really most of the collapse had been achieved by the end of the 7th of April but there were smaller increments of collapse on the 12th and then right at the end on the 17th up on the northern rim. Um, and this, this collapse activity, so I probably didn't emphasise it but the fountains on the flank began on the 2nd of April and so this collapsing started three days later on the 5th of April. And that's not a coincidence. To understand why we're getting collapse at the summit, I've prepared a very simple cross-section. So this is like a slice through the earth oriented roughly west to east. And we've got the summit up here and Pit on Tremblay about here and the coast. There's a bit of vertical exaggeration, so the vertical scale is not the same as the horizontal. And this red blob is a very simplified, oversimplified magma chamber. So the, um, the eruptions that occurred at Pit and Tremblay didn't come from a magma source down there. They actually came from the magma source beneath the summit. And just show you this same view, but it explains why collapse occurred. So if you watch the summit carefully and the magma chamber carefully, you'll see they change. So magma was removed here sideways through an underground passage to Pit and Tremblay where it produced fountains and lava flows. And the draining of that summit magma chamber destabilised the top of the volcano, so it collapsed. So we'll just go back. That's how it was. Once the Pit and Tremblay activity began, the magma chamber beneath the summit lost a significant amount of its magma sideways, and so the summit collapsed. A very clear connection between the uh, summit activity and, um, and the collapse at the summit. Now, the, the next really surprising <laughs> thing to happen was lava started to pour out from the walls of the caldera. So this big cliff is the caldera wall and similarly over here. And there you can see these are images taken by helicopters you can see lava pouring out from different sites along the Caldera Wall, mainly the northern and the eastern sides. And, of course, this only happened after the Caldera formed, after the 5th of April. And the discharge, that's just the flow of lava, was really unsteady. It would stop and start. Some locations it would go for a couple of hours and others 20 minutes or so. And this is very uh, 
very puzzling because, as you know, when, as I just explained, when Caldera collapse occurs, that's a record of magma being removed from the summit. So it was very surprising to find magma available for summit eruptions um, because we know from the Pitt and Tremblay activity that the magma was actually moving sideways away from the summit. It wasn't erupting at the summit. So that's a puzzle that I will explain um, by going back now to this event on the 30th of March. Now, you remember I said there was inflation. The reason the volcano was rising is that magma was being forced in under the surface. We use the word intruded, underground. That magma reached the surface at number one, producing a small lava. But what happened once the caldera collapsed, that actually cut into that intrusion, allowing the emission of lavas from the caldera walls. So the intra-caldera lavas were not tapping the summit magma chamber, they were tapping this 30th of March intrusion. And I've got a little cartoon to try to show that. So this is a profile northeast to southwest of the way the caldera looked, sorry, the way the summit looked before the 5th of April, and then once collapse occurred, this, what was totally buried magma, was exposed and produced little lava flows from vents on the caldera wall. Um, there were also lots of explosions, dozens and dozens of explosions between the 5th and the 7th of, um, of April, after Caldera collapse occurred. And these explosions were very strongly correlated with each time a collapse increment happened or uh, when new lava emission sites opened up on the Caldera wall. The series of photographs, they're webcam still photographs and separated by, um, in this case, on the top row, 10 second increments um, and on the bottom row, different increments, but all less than a couple of minutes. On the, on the top one, what you can see is a lava flow um, emission site, then an explosion. That cloud is coming from an explosion. And sometimes there were explosions related to active steam fumaroles. That just means steam coming out of the ground. And down the bottom, this ser series, firstly, I've got an arrow pointing to some fumaroles and then uh, around about a minute and a bit later, an explosion, this grey cloud coming out from where there had been an active fumarole a few seconds before. So as I mentioned, there were dozens and dozens of these events uh, over the, the two to three days following Caldera collapse. Now, the reason this happened relates to the presence of underground water at the summit. So you'll be familiar with the idea that under the Earth's, under the ground, there's water in fractures and pore spaces in most locations around the Earth. We have what's called groundwater, and the surface uh, above which that water uh, doesn't occur and below which it's concentrated, is called the groundwater table. And volcanoes are especially porous. They typically have lots of groundwater. So these explosions were related to two things, the presence of underground water and the fact that we've got a lot of heat coming in from the magmas. So what was happening was either lava was interacting directly with groundwater, heating it up, it was flashing to steam and producing steam explosions. Or sometimes it was just hot wall rock. Um, sometimes the wall rock got enough to make water flash to steam and magma not being directly involved, but enough expansion of the steam to get a steam explosion. So once Caldera collapsed, 
happened that exposed the hot wall rock and the magma to the aquifer, allowing intracaldera explosions to go on. They wouldn't have happened if there hadn't been caldera collapse. So that's a lot of action going on at the summit. The final activity was nowhere near the summit. It was right at the coast. Um, on, uh, following the, the Pit and Tremblay uh, fountaining activity, the lavas reached the coast and spectacular explosions went on for a day after that. Well, why was, why was that going on? Well, it's actually a bit similar to that intracaldera explosion. So instead of interacting with an underground aquifer, the lava interacted with seawater. And this is what goes on to drive an explosive eruption of that nature. What happens is the seawater gets heated up and flashes to steam. And that involves a very big and very rapid expansion. It's a special kind of explosive activity that we call phreatomagmatic, which is essentially steam or water plus magma. What's really interesting about this is that these explosions weren't linked to a vent. Okay? It's what we call rootless activity. It was going on way out here on the coast, nowhere near either the pit and tremblay vent or the vent at the summit. Coastal eruptions like this are also known as littoral explosions because they happen in the tidal zone. Um, and this was the, the connection with Pitt and Tremblay. So here's where the lavas were being generated by the fountains and we're way over here on the coast where explosions started on April the 6th. But they are rootless explosions very spectacular nevertheless. And this view, I put this one in just to try to show you. These are the lavas coming to the coast and this was the focus, that's big explosion beginning here, and lots and lots of steam being generated. White clouds like this essentially are mainly steam. The black parts are full of fragments um, gener generated by breaking up during the explosions. And this activity produced pyroclastic deposits at the coast. And you can go there and measure them and study them. This is um, Daniele here about to start digging a big hole because <laughs> that's what he had to do um, to examine. So this, sorry, I should have explained. This is the foreground is a uh, uh, lava and above the pyroclastic deposits is another lava and it's this layered, loose deposit that was generated by those coastal explosions. Most of them were eroded by the sea and we only get preserved sections where they were covered by lavas. When we look at, at the fragments in these sorts of sections, you'll see in the bottom right, it's shiny, it's made of volcanic glass, but volcanic glass, it has a lot of holes in it and originally, those holes were filled with gas, a combination of steam and the magmatic gas. Uh, so the reason Danielle's digging a hole is that we needed to get to the base of the succession so we could make a full um, profile to look at how the fragments were changing and the different ways that they were being uh, generated by the explosions and the direction of the explosions. And this is a diagram, a cartoon, that tries to illustrate the main stages in the building of that deposit. And there were four main stages that related to very subtle differences in, in the activity, but essentially all steam-driven explosions at rootless vents where the lava met the sea. So we're now back pretty much at that same slide that I began with showing the sequence of events and the location. So number one was a little lava, but very importantly, an intrusion, a magma forcing its way underground near the summit. 
and then two were the fountains that fed lavas, and three was the caldera collapse with lavas and explosions inside the caldera, and number four, the coastal explosion. So what are the connections? Well, we now think that the uh, lavas and explosions that occurred inside the caldera were directly related to the intrusion that happened on the 30th of March. That's the only way you can explain lava pouring out of the caldera margins and those um, steam explosions inside the caldera. And then secondly, very, very clear link between the fountains and caldera collapse. The fountains on Pitt and Tremblay removed the summit magma chamber. The support for the summit uh, was removed, so we, we had caldera collapse. And then the uh, third major very clear connection is that the, the lavas from the fountains were the trigger for the coastal explosions. There's no vent at number four. Those explosions were driven purely by lava seawater interaction. So the next series of three or four slides is really just a summary of those events, starting with the 30th of March when we had inflation of the summit. This is, is again a cross section, inflation of the summit. No eruption at the summit, okay, so the magma stayed totally underground but pushed the surface up. There was a little lava flow generated but none of any kind of significance in terms of volume. Um, and then on the 2nd of April, the fountains began at Pitton Tremblay out here on the uh, eastern flank at 600 metres above sea level, much, much lower than the summit, um, about two kilometres lower than the summit. And that activity very efficiently drained the summit magma chamber, resulting in caldera collapse. So fountains on the flank led to collapse at the summit. Um, and it took about three days for this magma chamber to be drained sufficiently for collapse to occur, because that's the timing relationship between the initiation of the fountains and the uh, collapse at the summit. And uh, this event at collapse at the summit intersected that 30th of March intrusion, so we got lava flows coming out of the caldera wall and explosions. That's what these two photos are showing you on the right. And that activity, mostly 6th and 7th of April, but it actually went on a bit longer than that. Uh, and by the 6th of April, the flank lavas, fountain-fed flank lavas, reached the sea, triggering the coastal uh, phreatomagmatic explosions that I was explaining there. There's no vent there. It's purely surface interaction between hot lava, lava um, and the sea. So the 6th of April, it was a really big day. Uh, there were still collapses going on. The volcano was super busy doing everything on one day. Uh, these collapse events were accompanied by lavas and explosions inside the caldera. The fountains at Pitt and Tremblay were still active and that was the day that the lavas that reached the sea caused the rootless explosions at the coast. It was the one day where all four um, activity sites were going on simultaneously. So this is, is the final slide and it's essentially just a, a summary of what happened and our major conclusions. Um, this, this list is actually, of what happened, is actually somewhat condensed because the vigorous fountains at the flank vent, for example, in, involved three vents that were simultaneously active. Um, the caldera collapse was a piecemeal event that mainly concentrated over two to three days but went on until the end of the 
eruption um, and lots and lots of explosions of two different sorts and then the, the literal explosions at the coast. So it, it actually simplifies uh, it simplifies what is already a complicated list of different eruption styles. And what we've been able to figure out is that what you see at the surface very strongly reflects a control by the underground movement of magma, where the magma was and where it was available um, to erupt, what we could call the plumbing system. And basaltic volcanoes are famous for having very complicated plumbing systems. The magma doesn't just come out above the magma source, it can come out anywhere on the volcano. And this uh, conclusion that the shallow intrusion on the 30th of March was um, the source of the intricate caldera lavas actually implies that it wasn't connected to the summit magma reservoir, otherwise it would have also been drained by the flank eruptions at Pit and Tremblay. Um, and so that's a really uh, different conclusion compared with what is normally assumed to happen uh, at these kinds of volcanoes. It's, it's one of the few cases where we can demonstrate that an intrusion fed intracaldera lavas. And that's the end. Thank you.